My experience is that most Christians really want to read the Bible well. They want to go deeper into it. They really want to see some deeper things, and they want to see what God has to say for them there. But the problem is they just, they just don't know how. And there's a certain frustration when you go back into the Bible and you read it, you get bored with it, or you see the same thing that you saw last time. Uh, our goal in this chapter and the next few chapters is to try to give you some guidelines uh, and some help, some pointers to get you started, to allow you to read more, more carefully and deeper, to go into the text, to really pull things out of the text. Uh, this makes it more exciting for you, makes it more interesting, and allows you to hear more, I think, what God is saying. And on the other hand, it also helps you to read more accurately, the more closely that you're reading the text. A good analogy for good Bible reading is receiving a love letter. Uh, imagine a young man uh, named John, and he's in the early stages of a dating relationship, and his, and his girlfriend has moved away, and now he quickly is waiting for that first uh, email from her. And, and when he gets it, he opens it up and begins to read eagerly to see what, you know, what does she have to say? Uh, what does she have to say to him? Hi, John, she starts off, and he immediately is wondering, you know, why does she just say, hi, John? Why not, dear John? Or why? He begins to ask these questions and read through each line after line, uh, pondering, wondering the meaning of each word. What, what, what does she mean with each text? Uh, and this is similar to the way we want you to read the Bible. We want you to read carefully, closely, asking each word, pondering each shade uh, of meaning. And again, this, in this chapter and in the chapters that follow, uh, we'll be giving you some guidance on how to read in, the, in that manner. Uh, we're at the observation stage now. And what we mean by that is what we're trying to do in these next few chapters is help you to see. We want to see the text. We want to see the details of the text, try to identify uh, those texts, how to read very carefully. Carefully. Uh, we're not interpreting yet. Uh, the, the danger is to immediately read the text and then go straight to application, straight to interpretation. We want you to hold off. Hold. That will come. We're going to get to that. But in these early chapters, uh, we just want to see, teach you how to see things, identify this observation stage. Uh, and that's not to say that the text as a whole is not important. There is this ongoing parts and whole interchange. And we, and we recognize this. A lot of times when you first come to a text, you might read the whole text through, kind of look at the whole, what's the big picture. But then immediately you want to go back, start working slowly, phrase by phrase, word by word, sentence by sentence, back through the text and look at those details. So we recognize this parts whole interchange. But here in the next few chapters, we're going to try to help you how to go through slowly, how to go back into the parts, you know, phrase by phrase. What are we looking for? What gets this going? So in this chapter, chapter three, we're going to look at sentences, the smaller unit, things to look for at the sentence level. And then in the next chapter, we'll do paragraphs and a little bigger units. What are the things uh, in the biblical text to look for in a, in a paragraph size uh, passage? Uh, and then in chapter five, we'll look at uh, uh, what we call discourses, the, the chapter size, the story size unit. Uh, and these things are also kind of a little simpler uh, in, the, in the sentence level, chapter three. And as you get to bigger units of text, what you're looking for, the things that you're looking for get a little more complex. So we're going to start with some simpler types of things to look for here in chapter three. Uh, and as we move to larger pieces of text, then we're going to get a little more complex in the kinds of things that we're looking for. So let's get started. Things to look for in sentences. What are we, how, what are we looking for? Uh, one of the first things you want to look for, and one of the easiest, is just word repetition. Look for things that are repeated over and over in the text. Anytime you see a word within a sentence or a couple of sentences that repeats, you need to mark it, circle it. Uh, for example, take a look at 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. Uh, but just as he who called you was holy, so be holy in all you do. For it's written, be holy because I am holy. Well, when you read that passage, you ought to see holy, holy, holy four times. You ought to circle that alarms ought to be going off in your head. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to answer, what is this passage about? Well, it's got something to do with holiness. Uh, so word repetition, mark those when you see them. Uh, that's one of the easier things uh, to do. So step one, look for word repetition. Uh, number two, look for contrast. Uh, anytime the biblical text is taking two things that are very different, 
placing them side by side in contrast, you want to ask, identify it, note, write down, this is a contrast, and then think through the contrast. Uh, Proverbs has lots of contrast. Uh, look for example, uh, Proverbs 15.1, a, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So what, what's he contrasting here? There's the contrast between a gentle answer and what it does, and a harsh word and what it does. So this is a contrast, and you want to look for these things, mark these things when you see them. Another good example, Ephesians 5, 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Uh, and a, the, a, a basic contrast you see often in the Bibles between light and darkness. And so anytime you see light and darkness, you want to circle them and say, here's a contrast. But notice this text is not just a contrast of darkness and light. It's a contrast of what you were to what you are now, that you were darkness and now you're light in the Lord. So you have a little more complicated contrast. Uh, so number one, look for repetition. Number two, look for things that are contrasted. And number three, of course, similar uh, to contrast, look for comparisons. When do you see a comparison uh, between two things? You want to mark this down. Uh, Proverbs 25, 26, a good illustration of this. Uh, like a muddied spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give way to the wicked. Well, what's he comparing here? He's comparing a righteous person who caves in to the wicked, he's being compared with a, with, a, with a nice water spring bubbling up that should be a pure, clean water source that somebody has uh, polluted. He's spilled dirt in or he's gotten mud into it and he's basically ruined, ruined the spring. Uh, so it's a comparison. So look for contrast and look for the opposite side, the comparisons. Number four, list. You want to look at list. Anytime you're reading in your text and you see more than two items in a row and becomes three or four items, uh, in a list, you want to mark that down. This is a list, and you want to analyze the list. A couple of good examples, Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So here's a long list, and so you want to clearly see the, the biblical authors giving you this list. And then you want to Think through the list. Look at it. Uh, is, there an, is there an order to it? Uh, is there a grouping? How many elements are in the list? I mean, count them. There's nine in this list here. Uh, and uh, do they group together? This particular list kind of falls together in groups of three. Uh, love, joy, and peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and then faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, lists show up, all kinds of different lists in the Bible. They'll give you a list of uh, people, uh, places. Sometimes the Old Testament will give you a list of cities. And you want to stop and say, well, where, where are these cities? Is it a geographical list? Are they moving from north to south? What's the point of the list? Are they going in a circle? Sometimes they go, well, uh, list uh, uh, nations in a circle as they go around Israel and list out their neighbors. Uh, but you'll see other uh, attitudes and attributes, things. The famous passage in 1 John, uh, love not the world. And they list out the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. Uh, well, there's three-part list. Mark that as a list and uh, identify those lists when you come across them. So number four was list. Number five is cause and effect. Uh, this is very common in the biblical text where the authors will give you a cause and effect relationship. Uh, and again, back to Proverbs 15.1. Uh, here you have uh, two cause and effects that comprise the verse. The first one, a gentle answer. That's the cause. What's the effect? It turns away wrath. Uh, on the other one, that's contrary. You have a harsh word. That's the cause. And then what does it do? It stirs up anger. So when you're studying, you recognize them as cause and effects. I find it helpful to mark that. I put a C where the cause is. I put an E over where the effect is. And I connect those uh, with a line showing where this cause and effect is uh, in, in the text. Another good example in the New Testament here, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. Here's a very clear cause of sin. And what's the effect here? The effect is death. Uh, and so mark those, cause and effect, uh, as you study, study the text. Uh, number six is figures of speech. Uh, figures of speech are very important and, and powerful uh, uh, literary uh, devices that are used throughout, throughout the scripture. What a figure of speech is, is 
simply a, uh, uh, it's, it's a word being used in a sense other than its most literal, the most normal literal sense. Uh, and we use figures of speech all the time, and all the time is a figure of speech. Uh, it's an exaggeration, and that's, that's one of the many figures of speeches that are used. Uh, take an example, Psalm 119, 105, where the psalmist says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. So he's taking the word of God, and in a figurative sense, he's describing it as if it was a lamp. Uh, and of course, in the Old Testament time, you know, you don't have electric lights or street lights. So to go out at night in the pitch dark, uh, you would stumble around trying to find your way. And what the psalmist is saying is, is if you have a lamp, if you carry a lamp with you in the dark, then suddenly you can see where you're going and you can see where you're stepping, uh, allows you to walk without stumbling. And so he's saying, well, God's word is like that. It shows us how to go, how to walk. Uh, and so figures of speech then are very colorful uh, pictures uh, of, uh, of, of what the, the biblical author is trying to say. Or how about this one, one of my favorites in Isaiah 40. Uh, those who hope in, in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. So his image here of trusting in God is that you're just like one of these, you know, like an eagle that can just catch the hot air and, and, uh, and soar eff effortlessly. Uh, uh, when I was uh, growing up as a kid in New Mexico, we had a, lived right at the base of a big mountain range, and the big hawks there would uh, soar in right at the face of the mountain, catch the hot air drafts, and they would rise up a thousand feet or so, and then they would coast back over, and then they could just circle around looking for, uh, uh, for, for, for prey uh, without flapping their wings at all. And then as they would descend down, they would drift back in, catch the hot air, and rise back up again. And so this is a very powerful uh, figurative image that the psalm I mean, that Isaiah uses to show what it's like to trust in God. You're just like one of these effortless eagles that soars. Uh, and so... Uh, the figures of speech remind us that the Bible connects uh, at not only an intellectual level, but at an emotional level. And I think sometimes we miss that. But that's the point of figurative language is that it pulls us in emotionally. It paints a picture that connects with not just our head, but, uh, but with our heart. Uh, so when you see figures of speech, you note them, mark them. Say, here's a figure of speech. And then go one step beyond that. Try to visualize it. What's the image? What are they trying to portray with these figures of speech? Let the, let the author pull you into it uh, with the imagery that he gives you in the figure of speech. Number seven, conjunctions. Of course, there's a, 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 a grammatical issue. Uh, when you come in uh, for conjunctions, you want to ask and conjunctions, you know, words like and or for, therefore, since, and but. Uh, when you see those conjunctions, mark them and then ask again, what, what are they there for? Uh, a good example, again, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but... And that's that conjunction, but is huge there. And note the wonderful contrast between death and but, the free gift is eternal life. Uh, so as you come across these conjunctions, you want to, you want to mark them. Sometimes they're quite easy to note uh, as the conjunction here. But in, in Colossians, a little more complicated. Therefore leads the beginning of the verse. Therefore is God's chosen people holy and uh, dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. The therefore here, of course, introduces the verse, but therefore is based on something previous to this. So in the biblical text, you want to look up, circle this therefore, and then you want to see what are they referring back to. Sometimes it's the verse right in front. It might be several chapters that precede this. He may have built an argument over several chapters and then said, therefore. Uh, here in Colossians 3, of course, uh, a few verses earlier, he has just uh, uh, told them to put on the new self, that now they're in Christ, you have a new self, put on your new self. And so then here is this verse, therefore, because of the new self, then clothe yourselves uh, with compassion, kindness, humility. So note all of the conjunctions, circle them, mark them, and then ask, what are they doing? If you have a therefore, look back up and see why, uh, what is the therefore referring back to? So that was number seven, conjunctions, okay? Number eight, uh, verb tenses. And what I would encourage you to do with verb tenses is just whatever your how much grammatical skill do you have? How much training do you have? Uh, just run with that. Go as far as you can go with analyzing the verbs. I mean, verbs are where all the action uh, is. It's the, it's the mortar for the bricks, you know, that build, uh, that build the biblical text. And by verbs, I mean, uh, uh, what kind of verb is it? Uh, look at each verb and ask, 
Uh, is this a present tense? Is it future tense? Is it past tense? Uh, ask things like, is it imperative? Are they just telling us? Is it an indicative ex explaining kind of verb? Or is it an imperative kind of verb? Uh, or another important distinction to notice in biblical text is, is it an active verb or is it a passive verb? Uh, by active, you know, Bill hit the ball. Passive, the ball was hit by Bill. Uh, and so look and see, is there an active or is there a passive kind of tense? Uh, a good example, Colossians 3, 1. Uh, Since then, it says, you have been raised with Christ. And now notice this is a passive idea. So it's important for us to see this. Theologically, that's important. So not something that we did. We didn't raise ourselves up. We've been raised up with Christ. So it's a passive sense. So mark that verb and say, this is, this is passive. And then immediately after the passive verb, you have been raised, is an imperative. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. And so note that passive verb and then note the imperative sense. So verbs are important to mark as you go through. Circle them. And again, as far as your you know, grammar training is, go as far as you can with that analysis of the verbs that we see. Uh, number nine is pronouns. Anytime you're in a text, you want to identify what the pronouns are. And don't just read over them and don't make quick assumptions. Uh, Ephesians 1.3 is a good example. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms. So you want to note both the our Lord Jesus Christ and the us in the heavenly realms, and then ask, who is that referred to? Uh, Paul is the author here, but when he uses our, who, who does he mean? Does he mean Paul and his co-authors like Timothy? Does he mean Paul and the Ephesians? Does it include Paul and all Christians of all time? Uh, and so anytime you have pronouns uh, in any of the text, you want you know, to mark the pronoun, circle it, and then identify it. You know, who, does the pronoun, who does the pronoun refer to? So we've given you nine things here to look for, and they're not, uh, this is not an all-inclusive type of list. They're not the only things you look for. We want you to read carefully, to look carefully, to see things, to ask questions. And it's important to start writing it down. We really think that the in-depth Bible study analysis, uh, you've, got to, you've got to mark these things down. Howard Hendricks says the pen's like a metal crowbar. Gets your head going. It gets your, it gets your mind thinking. So uh, get you a text. Uh, here's an example here from Romans 12. Uh, get your text and write, you know, C for cause and E for effect and circle the words that are repeated. Uh, circle the, the, the pronouns, identify them, and then other observations. Just look and look and keep looking uh, for these things. If there's a figure of speech, I'll just write FOS on it, figure of speech, but then ask, what is the figure of speech? And try to identify that figure of speech. Um, and then like, uh, like the lovesick uh, boy who's reading his love letter at the beginning, uh, go back over, read the text, don't assume you get it all the first time. Read it again, look at it again, read it again, see what observations you get, mark them down, read it again. Uh, and this re repetitive going back over the text, marking as you go and reading as you go <clears throat> yields the results that allows you to get in the text, to have this time of observation uh, and to see the text in a new way and see the things in that text that God has planned for you.